Okay, All friends. Right. So. Right. Good morning, guys. I, I really appreciate it. My name is Jeremy Renna. Uh, I am the managing partner at Anner Consulting on the side when I'm not the chief revenue officer at Beyond Main, uh, who is obviously, as you know, in great partnership with WeShop SC as the strategic and technological backbone to WeShop SC. Uh, and really helping, we've been helping along with, you know, under the tutelage of Kate uh, and leadership of Kate and the team, uh, we've been leading the integration of WeShop SC into communities statewide. So it's really an honor to be here. Uh, <clears throat> and I appreciate Kate asking me. Uh, I've been able to work with some of the companies, some of those on the phone. I see Glenda out there. I have to acknowledge Glenda and Hartzogs, an unbelievable business with an unbelievable treasure trove of data that I am probably swimming in to, up to my neck. And we'll figure some good things out for you, Glenda, along the way. But um, we've been enjoying it. Huh? We're good. I'm glad. I'm glad it can go. I can go a mile a minute, and I'm going to try and slow down for this pricing strategy review and just kind of take you through some core elements, things you already know. When you're a small business person, you are far smart, smarter than me. I have only recently become a small business person, and it is hard. I'm not going to tell you any other thing. And so when we come to figuring out pricing, Pricing is something that big companies have a tremendous difficulty figuring out. If you've been down to the local Belks, you've been down to, you name it, Walgreens, CVS, goods are priced all over the place. Maybe they're priced correctly, maybe they're not. But you walk up and you go, how on earth could they be pricing this at $7, $9? That makes no sense. There's a real good shot there wrong. And the beauty of it is you as the customer get to vote if they're right or wrong, right, with your wallet. So if you buy it at that price, then they were right. Uh, and, if, uh, and if you don't, then they're going to have to go back and evaluate it, and inventory is going to pile up, and they're going to have to figure out what the right price it needs to be to actually exit the shelves. Back in the day when I ran the Macy's division, of Lid Sports Group, we had crazy, those cra ugly Christmas sweaters uh, that we retailed for, let's say, $49.99. Uh, well, we had, I got to Orlando in June, and we had leftover ones on the, on the floor at $4.95. And you tell me anybody willing to pay $4.95 for an ugly Christmas sweater in the middle of June in 95 degrees with 95% humidity was not selling, no matter what the price is. So pricing is complicated is my point. And what we really want to walk you through is that anybody who says they have it figured out, they're lying to you, uh, even the manufacturer, okay? So the manufacturer may suggest a retail price. That is not to say that that's the right price. That's some folks in a room that said, that's the price we want to send it out to our vendor uh, and our clients, vendors and our clients. What we really, what they really have behind it is a structure, a pricing structure of how much the goods cost them. And so that yields them uh, a manufacturer suggested retail price. So what I want to do, and I want before I get into this, um, and I, I'd love to make it interactive, but these kinds of things lends to, lend to, uh, the, the the presenter talking uh, almost too much, um, I would say. So I, I may ask Kate a question or two, not to put any of our uh, any of our guests on the on the spot or on the hot seat. Though, though I feel like I'm getting a better relationship with Glenda. I could put one on there, but I but I wouldn't. Uh, but he, he, at the very outset, I want to say thank you to Coresight Research and Competera. Uh, they put they put out tremendous materials on pricing. They put tremendous materials out on a lot of things, but getting online and following companies like Coresight Research are something all business owners should do, right? Learning every day is a great thing. Having that as a, oh, did we think of that? 
right? Super important. So who am I to go come up with a pricing strategy review for a Wii shop beyond Maine and the South Carolina market? I'm a nobody, right? I have 25 years of experience in retail, 20 years at Macy's, four at uh, Lid Sports Group, and then another ooh, three and a half. I guess 20 plus four plus three and a half. I definitely shouldn't be a pricing person if I called that 25. But then I'm only 25 years old, so you know, it makes it simple. Um, so we need to learn things. We need to learn things from other folks and from research. So that's what we've gone ahead and done. So you're going to see a lot of quotes. You're going to see a lot of charts. I did not do these charts. I took these charts and hopefully by saying Corsite and Compaterra enough times, you'll excuse the fact that other people did a lot of hard work that I've analyzed and hopefully can help you out. So what we want to accomplish today, Kate, I hope that's okay. You'll give me thumbs up. You'll, you'll break in when, when I've gone awry. So uh, what we want to do is uh, review pricing at a high level and why it's important to business success. I, I don't think it's rocket science to say that if I buy a product for $2 and I try and sell it for $1, I'm not going to be in business very long. Okay. So but what's the, if I bought it for $2, what's the right price to put it out on the floor for? That becomes a huge challenge, right? Or if I bought it for $50, what to put it on the, uh, on the floor for, really in a, in a real way. And the manufacturer is telling me one price, but maybe I need to go above that. What if I can go below that? What are the implications, right? Then... I'm gonna throw out, based on the research that we have here, some of the components of optimal pricing strategy. Obviously, improved margins. If I price it right, more money's gonna come in our pocket, and that's okay. I want people to realize that you're not, pardon the, pardon the term, screwing the customer by charging an extra dollar or rounding up, right? Pricing strategy is coming up with a fair price that the market will spend on the goods you have. It's not always the cheapest, and it's not always the ex most expensive, right? We can create different strategies and say, I wanna be a luxury retailer, right? Louis Vuitton is the great example. They're never gonna have a price that's super low because that's not how they roll, right? In the same way, Dollar Tree is never gonna have a super expensive price because that's not how they roll, right? Everybody has their way. So in your business, understanding who your customer is and understanding what price band you want to live in, super important. And that's something the small business person has to come to on their own as a base strategy. But then as they look at their merchandise mix, if I'm only bringing in chewing gum and candy, my pricing has to be low because the customer can find it everywhere at a low price. If I have incredibly unique items, if I'm an antiquing situ you know, situation, that kind of business, I can charge more, right? Because these are unique items. Customer can't find them every, anywhere else. They have to come in and, and see if they like them. They have to come and deal with, with me. Increased mar margins, increased revenue, right? The easiest thing, we're, we're doing an analysis for a, for a company in South Carolina, and we see that they sell, sold fewer biz items in that category in 2023 than in 2022, but the price was a little bit higher than it went out the door. So now we've increased sales on fewer items. That's a strategic benefit to us, right? It may be that, hey, I just didn't mark that down. I didn't put that, those items on sale. I sold fewer of them, but I sold them at a higher price, right? So that can be a win. Other piece here is increased customer lifetime value. Some of the things that I've found as we walk through and learn about Main Street, South Carolina, and I don't just mean the Main Street organization, shout out to Jenny and, and Jonathan and the team, obviously, uh, but, but every downtown that you walk through in the 72 or whatever the 
whatever the number keeps getting quoted as the right number of uh, loca- of, of small towns in, in South Carolina, right? We have an incredible loyalty program. That loyalty program is my hometown, my small town, right? Belk, Macy's, Dillard's, big guys have to create these vast loyalty programs, right? Where you have a key fob and you swipe and maybe they give you points and all the rest, right? My loyalty program in a small town is I walk in and I know the owner. I know who she is behind the desk. I know all her kids and her grandkids are running around in the store. I feel comfortable there. She gets a new product in. She offers that product to me at a fair price. Um, If I'm excited about that product, she's offered that because she knows me for years and years and years. And that's where I'm going to then get a sale, right? I'm going to buy that product. That store owner, by just being themselves in that small town, that's a loyalty program unto itself. So, priced appropriately, and again, I don't want to say cheap or expensive, but priced appropriately, now that customer comes back over and over and over and over again. And this is something that big companies struggle with, right? where, hey, how do I get the overall value of Kate right, coming into my store for the next 20 years? I go say, I'll be honest, I am loyal to, there she is, America Runs on Duncan, right? I go see the owner every day, my small town, Dun- my small town Duncan, right on Main Street, three blocks from my house. I'm in, he knows I'm getting a medium coffee, right? Because that's what I get. It's already ready for me, exactly the way I want it, right? That's small town America. That's small town customer loyalty. I'm going to come back. It's too easy for me. Why would I go do something else? Went to to another coffee shop, you know, Starbucks three miles away when I have this guy. So tremendously important. Then the fourth point, and again, I'm belaboring a lot of these pieces, and hopefully I'll get a lot of my voice out. I'll lose my voice. Everybody will be happy. Um, but we'll we'll get through these and then we'll go through a bunch of charts and some other things and help you out. But, Markdowns and dip discount optimization. If I price it appropriately, it might go out the door at regular price every day. That's tremendous for us, right? Because as you'll see in some of the math, right? If I can avoid markdowns, and that's really hard to do, which means slower selling SKUs, those are items that just are sitting, collecting dust, right? Those guys, if I can get them out of the way and bring in new fresh product that is not going to sit, that's a win for me, right? That's a win up and down this chain. If I can avoid the markdown, hopefully my rep came in and gave me the right product because I'm doing 17,000 things. I'm not necessarily a, an enormous expert in the keychain business or the clear bag for the game business, whatever it is. Oh, you tell me we could sell those? Great. Yeah, it makes sense. It's in our assortment. Great. I mean, we end up trusting folks in our sphere because we just don't, they're only 24 hours in the day. So making sure we're optimizing markdowns, tremendously important. So we'll go through those, <laughs> those things and a few more in, in the next few minutes. I promise I won't be too long. I'm already running out of steam. Kate, are we good? Okay, she's giving me the thumbs up. It's super dangerous to give me the thumbs up. Here we go. Okay, let's go to the regular rule of thumb on pricing. And this is incredibly important and incredibly inaccurate. I'll say it all at the same time, right? In general, if you go to the store and you buy a, I'll call it an apparel product, but it can be anything. It's this vest made by Columbia, not with the Anner logo on it, that you got to see me later, join our team, right? Columbia Vest, let's call it $100 just because we like, we live in a world of round numbers, right? This was manufactured probably in China, maybe in Vietnam, maybe in, you know, wherever, maybe in the US, all those sort of places, we hope, 
25 percent, 25 of those dollars that the that the customer pays ultimately find their way to the manufacturer. <clears throat> and that pays for the literally for the yarn, for the zipper, for the worker who puts it all together, finishing the product, packing that up and shipping it to the wholesaler or holding it for the wholesaler. So all those costs and what's happened, we know this very simply, right? All you have to do is turn on TV over the last 10 years and hear the political arguments that go on. But in an attempt to keep this, this from being $500, trying to keep it at $100, right? We've moved those manufacturing jobs away, probably from places like South Carolina to places where folks are making a dollar an hour instead of 10 or $15 an hour. And that's just the reality of how it's gone. So the matrix is how much is shipping versus how much is labor, right? That's a manufacturing issue. That's where those decisions are made. So when you hear something's made in China, it's because they can manufacture it cheaper and they can get it here in a, in a efficient kind of way, right? On these massive tankers, you see the one stuck in Baltimore uh, in the harbor, right? These massive tankers with tens of thousands, millions of products on each one of them, right? It's the miracle. My wife works in supply chain. It's the miracle of global shipping that allows us to buy products at low pricing, right? You no longer have to wait for the guy, the cobbler, you know, down the road, you know, from, uh, you know, 75 or 100 years ago to make your shoes and pay him X, you can buy a brand new pair of running sneakers and have them manufactured across the world and shipped to your local store and then buy them off the shelf, right? It's amazing. So now we have the middle ground, that's $25. Now we have the other $25 going to the wholesaler. So now you've got all these manufacturers, but they need to know what to manufacture. <clears throat> they haven't designed product. They haven't done any of this sort of stuff. So there's someone out there, usually we would call this a brand, right? Think of Nike as a wholesaler. Now they may play the wholesaler and retailer, right? But there are plenty of places. I know Kate used to work for Vera Bradley, right? Long and storied career at Vera Bradley, right? Vera Bradley's a wholesaler. They don't manufacture the products in their, in their office in Indiana. And if they do, Kate, you'll let me know, right? They, they manufacture them in some economically expedient, far flung place and ship those products to market, right? But they have a crew there that sells, somebody had to pay for Kate back in the day, right? They have an office. They also have a design team that is curating the product and saying, what's out there in the market? What can be done to, to sell this product? Do is orange the new black uh, kind of color, right? is what's the new thing that's happening? Where do I get those trends? And those trends date back hundreds of years, mostly from Paris. You know, you go back to the to the uh, beginnings of, of R.H. Macy in New York, and he would go to Europe and go, you know, take a steamboat, go across the ocean, pick styles, bring them back to America. It was the only place you could find them. And suddenly people bought them. So, that other $25 goes to that wholesaler. Then the 50% goes to the retailer, to you guys. And again, I would say to, uh, to Sheena, who is on the service side, this matrix doesn't work as well for that. This is different. And this is slanted a lot more in the retailer's favor, right? Because you don't have to source goods. You are the product as your service. But, and in any service industry, that's the case. So we give you kind of the level set here and then we play off of it. But the 50%, why does the retailer get 50%, right? That seems like a lot. They take a tremendous amount of risk, okay? They're putting out products that they hope will sell. Hope is not a strategy that we endorse, right? We wanna know that they're gonna sell. So that hope, they get, a, they get more money for the hope. They have to keep the lights on on a regular basis. They have to staff that store, right? They have to pay real estate costs for that store and all the rest. They need to market. 
all these things that go into the modern profit and loss statement, modern business plan, right? Those all sit on the retailer. So the product makes its way, that Vera Bradley bag that Kate came in and, you know, smiled at you and said, this is the, this is the bag of the season, right? You got to have it. Have it 10 deep. It retails for one, and manufacturer suggested retail price, $100, right? So, you know, and then you cut her a check and she'll see you next season and you're stuck with the product and you got to move it, right? So that's that's why you get the, the larger share. The retailer gets the larger share. A hundred percent of that ultimately is borne by the customer, right? So if you're paying a hundred dollars for the bag, for the vest, whatever it is, that's going to be borne by the customer. The problem is, and this is where pricing hits, and this is why why is Jeremy taking me through this? Why is he treating me like a three-year-old? And I apologize. I, I am I am attempting to set this up in the right way. Is when a customer refuses to pay $100 for it and it's sitting on the shelf, now I got to try and mark it down. Maybe I mark it down to 85. Maybe I mark it down to 80 in the hopes that the word, the magical word, S-A-L-E, right? Sale. Uh, draws me to it and says, I pay eighty dollars for that. That's fine, right? Where does that eighty dollars now? Now we've lost twenty percent. Where does that come out of? In most small business cases, it's the retailer. Okay, so now suddenly that that fifty percent doesn't look so good anymore. We're sitting at thirty percent, and we still have all the same costs. The lights didn't get cheaper. The people didn't get less, right? The real estate costs didn't get less. Insurance didn't get less. So now we've got 20 bucks out there that's hanging out there going, hmm, I just gave that away to get it off, to get it off the floor. And by the way, turning it into cash, tremendously important, because by the way, <clears throat> that gives you $80 in your pocket versus $50 out of your pocket. You already paid for the goods. So all the reasons why we got to try and get pricing right. Hard to do. Okay, and here I thought I'd go 10 minutes. Now I'm just carrying on and on and on. I am trying. Apologize. I just have one. There we go. I moved that out of the way. That's why we agree pricing is important. <clears throat> right? Again, we like to thank the folks at Core, CoreSight and Contera and uh, Kate I hope will share this deck physically with the team as well, um, that would be appreciated. But it's a complex business function, right? And everybody screws it up, let's be clear. You have to know your customer really well. What kind of price elasticity they have, right? Are they willing to pay X, Y, Z? The good news of having a loyal, co a loyal customer base is you can ask, right? You can talk to your best customers. Hey, I'm bringing in this handbag. Is this something of interest? Well, how much would it be? Ooh, 120 bucks. I don't know, right? You may pass on what the salesperson from and the rep from particular brands come in and try and sell you because you've heard from your customer that it's not necessarily the right thing for you. So, but what is optimal pricing strategy? And this is the key part of this. It's, it's a comprehensive strategy that takes into account internal and external factors. Hey, if that handbag I put on the floor, I need to put it at $110 because the rent is high or my I need more people on the floor or I just made a big capital investment. I may, mean, I may need to do that knowing that I might sell fewer, but I may make more money on that product because of internal factors external factors as well. We know about, we all go to the grocery store, we know inflation is real. And you can go and see it on reports and say, hey, it's getting less or it's getting more. You're talking about 7% and then another 3% and then another 2%. You see it in gas prices, you see it in the price of bread, you see it in the price of cheese, you see it in the price of everything, right? It is more expensive to live in 2024 than it was to live in 2019. Simply but, right? Yeah, we had a pandemic in between. 
Yeah, we did all sorts of stuff. Doesn't matter, right? From a reality of a small business, we have external factors. That being said, there's kind of two edges to that coin. One is the customer is now getting used to paying more money for stuff. That, from our perspective, is good, right? A little inflation is not the worst thing for business. It helps us grow average into retails. It helps us in general because, listen, if you don't have 3% growth, when your employee comes to you and you want to give them a 3% raise, that money's coming out of your pocket instead of the customer's pocket, right? If the boat continues to rise at 3% and salaries rise at 3%, then you're in line. If the sales come down, you know, or flatten out, now those salaries rising create a tremendous amount of gap pressure on us, right? Which is very difficult. So internal and external factors play in. We also have to take into account promotional calendar and seasonality. I don't know about you and, and maybe Cheeky Tees has a bigger, different promotional season. Maybe some of these other guys, right? But Christmas, they keep putting it on the 25th, right? We keep trying to get them to move it. But as a retailer, I tried to get them to put it in every month, right? They get left it on the 25th again this year. So seasonality and being prepared for those seasons and making the most of them, tremendously important. And when we talk about, when we look at what big business do, does, we really can learn from that. Those individual sales, those circulars, those pop-up ads, those things you see during November and December are things we ought to look at mirroring in some ways. Big business does them for a reason. They don't want to give away product. They want to capture customers. We want to take advantage of capturing customers as well. So I encourage you, again, that may mean I might want to go have it go out the door at, 110, at $100, but I'm going to price it $110 so that come Christmas time, I can put it on sale for $100, right? Something along those lines. And trying to think creatively within the structures uh, of our business. So what we want to do is, you know, a strategy that keeps them taking into account to ensure the pricing is aligned with the demand, right? If nobody's buying it, we got a problem, and aligns with the company's broader business goals. All right? Questions? Anything? Kate, we're good? Okay. Well, okay, this is an eye chart, but it's fun, and there are lots of colors and shading, and somebody else did it, which makes it my favorite, right? This is opto how why they really contribute to success, and they did uh, the folks at CoreSight did a bunch of research on this, and you guys can unpack this later. But really, when you think of it, if I price the product appropriately, I'm going to get more margin. We said it before, I'm going to get higher sales because now I'm not constantly making that markdown or the product is moving, any of those sort of metrics, right? I'm going to get that increased uh, lifetime value, though that's going to be a longer lead that I'm going to have to deal with, right? That's a, that's a betting on the come a little bit and then markdown optimization. So uh, what you would really, on this chart is interesting to me is that, so many folks say an optimal pricing strategy is very important. 87% according to their research. Which again, it's not rocket science that you would say that, but going ahead and executing one, very difficult. And be understand you're going to be wrong. It's okay to be wrong. You'll be, you'll be somewhere between... Let's say baseball, if you if you succeed three out of ten times, you go to the Hall of Fame. Basketball, if you succeed six out of ten times, you go to the Hall of Fame. If you succeed six, seven, eight times here, you're winning, right? But it becomes where the guy where you clearly identify the losers or the tail. That product simply didn't sell, right? So what we wanted, what do we want to do in that situation is Jeremy, stop throwing stats and charts that somebody else did onto this and tell me what to do. We have to identify incredibly clearly the products that are not selling, okay? 
This is a strategy that has been rolled out at major retailers for a century, right? Identifying, how do we identify it? We look on the shelf and they're still there, right? Very simple. It's not, I don't want to make it rocket science. I don't want to make you look at page 35, a report that your POS popped out for you to go, holy cow, we we own 10 of these and we've sold none. Of course, I walk in my store, my store is 2,000 square feet. I look on the shelf, it hasn't moved, right? And it hasn't moved for a 13 week period. Let's call it that. I'm going to give you that energy. That is a long lead time. Retailers in the in the in the bigger spaces, right? Everything targets Best Buy. All the guys, they might have four weeks. They might have six weeks. I'm going to give you guys 13 weeks on product. You have lower traffic, right? All those sort of things. If it hasn't moved in 13 weeks, it's a problem. Your customer core customer has come in. They have looked at it, and either the styling's off or the price is off. Okay, so now we own this product. What on earth am I going to do? I can do a number of different things. I can call my rep, and don't be afraid to do this. Call my rep and tell them to take it back. I'm a loyal customer to your brand. You charge me fifty dollars for this hundred dollar handbag. You said it would sell at a hundred dollars. For the last three months, it sat on my shelf prominently. I can show you all the pictures. Signed well, all the rest. I didn't put it on sale because you told me not to put it on sale. Right? Take it back. Give me something in its place that will sell, please. Right? That is a totally appropriate um, business conversation. That's one. Number two is what I'd say is now we got to find the right price to get it the heck off the shelf. Okay? So now we're going to look to mark it down. Again, we can ask our representative for markdown assistance. I have no problem asking that. It's a partnership. You're feeding their family. You ask that they help feed your family. Pretty straightforward, right? Ask them, hey, I've got to take a $20 markdown here. Can you help me out with 10? Because remember, they made their $25 already. They've got a couple bucks in their in their pocket. Can they give you five? Can they give you 10? Can they help you out in some way, assuming they've decided not to take the goods back? Now, if they say no to all those things, you mark it down till you till you get it out, and there's a cadence of that. Let's take it to 20%. I am not a believer in 10%. I just simply don't believe the customer resonates to 10% as a true value. They Once they see the two, that crooked number, that's something that's interesting. And we've done varying tests. I actually was involved in a test at Macy's and Lids where we had product at 50% off. And Macy's did this throughout their chain. You and, and you've seen it now at Penny's and Belt does it. A bunch of different folks do it. Either last call, last act, one of those things. What it used to be is you'd go, they'd take this, it would be 50 off. Great. Customer might look at it, wait for a coupon. So now 50 off plus a coupon, plus a coupon, plus a coupon. It went out the door at 72 off on average. Crazy number. What these guys did is they got smart and they said, we're not going to go to 50. We're going to go to 60 off. And we're going to go, oh my God, it's 60 off, maybe even more, but no coupons. So now it went out the door at 60 off, not the 72. Everybody was happy. And by the way, it flew off the shelves. So you can get a sense as you get deeper into your business, high product category, certainly high, low, you know, higher price things, lower price things, what the right kind of price, certain things will go out the door. And by the way, that'll help in your negotiations go forward with your clients. I can only imagine, Kate, somebody came in and you wanted them to pay $50 for, for a Vera Bradley handbag. And they said, my customer's not really ready to pay a hundred. I'd like to pay 40 for it. And you might enter into that negotiation or you might go, I'm not allowed to do that, right? Small business, unclear. So you can come off mute and answer that question. You're like. Uh, well, 
I mean, I guess it's just somebody depends. else is talking right <laughs> out of me. Yes. Pricing is complicated, right? <laughs> yes. So, so as a viewer, Bradley, you know, salesperson rep, when would small businesses push back on your, on your MSRP and your call it IMU, but your, your pricing? Um, we, yeah, occasionally we would get pushed back on, usually it was around more promotional activity, um, whether we were being overly promotional in the moment and discounting when it, what they felt it wasn't necessary, um, or vice versa when they wanted to be promotional with the product and we felt like that pricing needed to be held. So that was usually more of like the, and, uh, and that makes total kind of sense for those understanding, right? Veer Bradley wants to hold that handbag at a hundred dollars retail price in the market they don't want somebody selling it at 70 dollars, right mm -hmm. once somebody sends it sells it at 70 dollars, it cheapens the brand it cheapens the product it it tells everybody that they got the design and the pricing wrong right all mm -hmm. those sort of things that they don't want to let everybody know right so they're their stick to go quote uh you know theodore roosevelt right uh, speak mm -hmm. softly and carry a big stick. Their stick is, we're not going to sell you our brand anymore, right? And that's worrisome because, hey, that shelf space that now is a risk. They just did, you know, X number of thousands of dollars for me last year. My customer expects that brand. That brand is helpful to me. I don't want to lose that. So, again, we have all these various ways of doing it. No single one is always right. And you're going to be wrong. I can't say that enough. It's complicated, right? But if you do nothing, the product's going to sit there and you're going to dust it and you're going to get annoyed, right? But 13 weeks, let's put 13 weeks in our headset as one of those things, right? So another piece here, you may have a computer, you may have a cell phone that has Copilot on it or ChatGPT, feel free to ask ChatGPT, I do it all the time. Ask them these kinds of questions. Should I mark down the Vera Bradley handbag that Kate sold me, oversold me, you know? You'll see, you may get researched answers that really, and, and to be frank, asking ChatGPT, what price this is going out the door at, right? This product is going out in my, in these zip codes, in this area, it can be tremendously insightful, right? It used to be you had to get in your car and drive around and see all this stuff. Well, so much of it's accessible, accessible either online um, from online shopping or other research tools that, hey, we can ask those kinds of questions. Big companies spend hundreds of millions of dollars on systems, and they've really moved into this AI space, right? To better price product. They don't get it right. What I've sat in those meetings, right? And again, they're batting the same percentage you're batting. They're probably batting a little bit worse, but they got so many products, they're at scale, they, they survive it. But What's very interesting is that oftentimes we'll turn it, big companies will turn it over to computer and leave the human element out. We're blessed. We're 90% human element, maybe 10% tech, right? We've got a leg up in small business on getting the pricing right because we're just so much closer to the customer, right? So asking those questions, tremendously important. But you can see this is this is the hey guys it's not we don't always get it right right 52 percent of retailers are mispricing more than 10 percent of their products right and 52 percent of retailers are not properly executing more than 10 percent of their promotional campaigns so that's so perfect is is elusive there's the old adage that the amount of energy it takes to go from zero to 97 and a half percent is the same exact amount of energy that it takes an effort that it takes to go from 97 and a half percent to 99.5 right nothing's ever perfect so 
for that 2%, is it worth all that energy? Most of the time, not. So we just have to, to know what we're putting into it. This is an interesting chart, and I found the course site guys did a nice job of pulling this together because it plays to who we are, we in the small business community, <clears throat> from a pricing perspective. Don't think that because you're a level one, right, that you're so less better off than the guys who are fully automated. I, I don't see it that way. But what you see is here we have a group, right? that is fully manual, we're probably partially automated, right? We, we reprice based on constant manual checks. I'm really looking at that level two. That's probably the way we see small business today. I looked at the shelf and it hasn't, hasn't moved. I looked at the shelf, there's still 10 there, right? We're partially dependent on business rules. What's a business rule? I just gave you one, 15 weeks. Right? If the product's not moving, 13 weeks. And then maybe I have some integration. Maybe I have a POS system that allows me to plan things. Maybe I have a promotional calendar, right? all those sort of things. As I become more and more automated, I can become more and more automated and maybe be a little bit smarter. Likely not smarter, but absolutely automation will take the headache off you. Because instead of you going, when the heck is my 13 weeks up on that Kate handbag that she told me that orange was gonna sell, right? Now I have to sit there and say, oh, the, the bell goes off, the alarm goes off, right? So just some next steps and then I'll open it up for a few questions. I know we don't have a bunch of time, but Ask yourself, how am I pricing my products and why? Really thinking through the overall structure of my business, what my costs are, right? In the aggregate, if I kept doing that, is that going to make me money? Is it not? Price with a purpose, price with a strategy, right? Use technology you have, um, even if it means you need to ask for help. I see it all the time. Nate knows as we walk into small businesses and, right, we're, a, we're an e-commerce platform. Right? We shop as C beyond Maine, and you go, whoa, wait a second, let me get my granddaughter. She knows how to do this. Right? We've seen it. There's the floor shop in Gaffney. I love her. I forgot the name. Kate, remember remind me of the name. If you have it, if you don't, tell oh, Glenda. Glenda. <laughs> Glenda will remind me of the name. We uh, can yeah. ask a friend. Glenda. Daniel? Yes. Daniel. Yeah. So we went in and set her up, set, went to set her up on We Shop even with the profile, whatever it was, my granddaughter, she's be back in one minute, right? Boom, taking care of. It's okay to ask for help. Hey, can you help me on, you know, figuring out what the right price is this? What's Belk sell it for? What are these sell it for? I go and ask ChatGPT all the time. This is the product. Tell me all the folks who are selling it and what the right, and what that price is. It's a tremendous tool, right? The other thing I'd say, and I advocate this all over the time, all the places, test and learn and track your progress. Testing is, is the most amazing thing. Put that handbag out there for $110, see if it sells. If it's over $110, everybody wins. If you needed to put it down to 100, you can go ahead and put down 100 and then go, that test didn't do, go so well, right? I can do this with pricing. And this is kind of one of the biggest keys you do not have to listen to the manufacturer's suggested retail price. You as the retailer are the sole person who sets price. If somebody else that is in the supply chain tells you to set price in a certain way and forces you to set price in a certain way, that's called collusion, right? That is illegal. And by the way, there are a zillion cases of it, right? But you simply can't do it. Okay, I have a question. Sure, go ahead. So if I have a pro I have a company that um we had the bag priced and it wasn't at their suggested retail price. And are you saying that that's collusion? No, so so if you it, take the handbag, right? They got will take a handbag that Kate that Kate sold me. I it they're suggesting I put it on sale for $100. I can put it on sale for $150, 
I can right. set it, put it on sale for $95. I can do anything. I spent my money on it. It's my handbag. I bought it from the vendor. Now, that being said, if I sell it below MSRP, and this is what Kate talked about, right? If I sell it below MSRP, the vendor could come back and say, I don't want to sell you anymore. You didn't play nicely in my sandbox. That's totally appropriate, right? That's fine, but that's where I say to businesses, and I may have said it to Glenda, right, at a particular point in time, is, hey, I want to sell this handbag, but it's not selling. If if you can take if you don't take it back, I gotta sell it at a price that's less than you want me to sell it. So help me out, right? That's not collusion. That's business. Right. Okay. Well, we just um, we had products online and they weren't at their suggested retail price, which we so we just took them offline. We still sell them for that price. We just don't sell them online anymore. So got it. Again, different frameworks where right. hey they have their own site if you're selling them the real issue comes down if you're selling them for less most yeah. most brands if you're selling them for more won't have an issue but if you need right. to, if you feel like you need to sell them for less that is a real conversation that you ought to have yeah. with your brand represent those brand rep and the other um, thing I will add that's usually an ex well, at least it was during my days that was sort of an exceptional area could be loyalty programs. So if you have a store loyalty program, um, most brands don't interfere, or at least in the small business sector, they won't interfere with your store loyalty program. So if you're offering promotional opportunities across all of your inventory and it's you know that brand can be a part of it so that's sort of a loophole right. to, go yes. to be able to and, um, and, and Kate that, that cuts across big big business as well anybody who's who's gone to Kohl's and gotten Kohl's cash mm -hmm. that's a markdown right yeah. but they but but Tommy Hilfiger doesn't want their products on sale for instead of 40 bucks 20 bucks but they're more right. than happy for you to earn $20 in Kohl's cash and spend it on the time yeah. effort. So it's all semantics and, you know, and perception. But yeah. Right. Right. Thanks. Um, we have another question from Cheeky Tees. Um, what, Jeremy, I'm just curious, do you want to take a first stab at answering? What do you say to customers that are complaining that the price is too high? We are a, there's a, a it depends on the product. But what I'd say is we're blessed to be able to always in a positive way, right? Everything, everything about customer interactions, I continue and I'll always say in a positive way, right? Is we love bringing you these products as the price, right? As the prices have increased with, over time at the manu point of manufacturing, shipping costs, wholesaling costs and all the rest, that's just all passed through. I come back to my salon, right? Still comes back to 100% that the customers pay. And okay? so if this is out of whack and you say, you're, you're trying to take 75%, say, look, feel free. You can look online. You can look other places. Feel free, we'll price match. If you find the same product, right? That says, I have unique product. That's why I can price it that way. And by the way, if they find it for less somewhere, you have every right to price match. A lot of folks do. So hopefully that I don't, I'm not as read in on your assortment, um, but if it's certainly anything that's unique product, you have the ability to set price on. So, hey, become a loyalty member today and every $200 you spend with us, I'll give you a $10 break. Right. Something along those lines can bring the price down, you know, in a short term. But think of the price of milk. If I went to the store and complained about the price of milk. It's too expensive. They go, that's how much it costs. Right? Yeah. The cows, these cows these days, they're getting, you know, they're getting pampered. Um, actually, while you have this up, it might be great uh, to kind of talk about some of the differences when it comes to like service based businesses and how this sort of may differ instead of having obviously manufacture um, or wholesaler costs, which you might have, you know, in terms of yeah. like bundling, 
but really where you want to, where, where I see the, some of the, um, pricing getting off track is when the cost of time or even just fixed costs of operating your business aren't really factored into your service provider pricing. Um, so sometimes we just like to sit down and like truly think about what does it take for you to offer that service? How much time in terms of with the client versus preparatory for the client or in maintaining your space or whatever systems you need, kind of really sitting down and like itemizing all of those things out and drilling it down to like, what do I need to charge to even like cover my costs of operating and providing this service and then building that margin on top of it yep. is how you get I, I, to Listen, there's also competition in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. If you're a nail salon or you're a barber shop. I have a barber shop in town. They charged $18 for a haircut, for a men's haircut, for years. There you go. I, a radical, you know, approach to, uh, to, to a haircut. Guy opened up across the street. Nicer environment, charging 30 What happens to my, to my guy? He instantly goes to $25. Right? That's a price for service. His costs didn't particularly change, but his market changed. And so you can go across street and pay 30. Now he's the discounter, but he was able to get seven more dollars. Now, still got other places, right? That's, hey, I'm in an inflationary environment. Sorry, you know, he can make that excuse. Plus he could say, feel free, go across the street, right? But not shorting what it costs you. That's number one. And paying yourself a living wage. No one's asking you to pay yourself minimum wage. No one's after like, like let's give ourselves a solid salary. And at the very least, your accountant will be able to write that off. Good morning, my boy. Okay. Less taxes, right? So, because your business is, is doing those sort of things. But when, <clears throat> when you're trying to figure out what the right price is, looking around and saying what everybody else charges has to be number one because you have to figure out where you're fitting in that competitive landscape. Now, if you're the only <laughs> massage place in town, right, you can go look online and see what the right prices are for more industrial massage envy, whatever it is, right, and say, okay, those are the costs. I can be playing that range. You don't want to walk into a place where you're thinking you're going to pay 40 bucks and they're charging, you're charging $120. That's going to, you, that's going to turn off the customer potentially, right? But if everybody, if it's charged 40 in an industrial place and that's a 20 mile drive away and I pay 50 in town, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Right? Because there's two sides of it. There are your costs to make the, make it work. But the other side of it is, hey, I'm a convenience. I'm a local. Shop local has a certain level of convenience to it. I'm saving gas costs. I walked, you know, whatever that might be. I grabbed my coffee and I went over. All those sort of things. When my wife goes to Main Street and gets her nails done, right, it's relatively simple. She's going to go there to any of the three or four places on my Main Street that have that and pay $5 more and drive 20 minutes through traffic, blah, 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 all this sort of thing to some larger point. So, again, you're going to get it wrong sometimes. Don't worry about it. Keep testing, keep learning. Yep. Great, great suggestions. Uh, we are right at 10 o'clock, but I, if there are any other sort of last final thoughts or questions, please feel free to come off mute or ask them or type them in the chat. Um, we can I do have one question. Just um, and I, um, so we have carry brands that are also have their own online. You know, um, let's just take Mud Pie for example. Um, they have their own website. Every everything's priced on their website. When it comes into our store, we try to be in line with what they um say so that they say an item's fifty five dollars then we mark it fifty five dollars because we think you know in a broad sense people can look and see what the price is because they have instant access to all yep. that information. So yep. us having it at 
59 or 62 would do us a disservice potentially, even though we have more costs involved than, than they, the manufacturer does. But um, do you have thoughts on that? Sure. They're taking advantage of being the retailer and the wholesaler all at once. So right. they get 75%. Right. right. It's not fair, but they're the guys taking the risk. You are sitting there going, wait a second, my costs are such. Now, the thing, Glenda, you have that they don't have is you have a loyal Hartzog customer, right? right? So to charge 59 and go, that's how much it costs at Hartzog. And if people pay it, yay. If they don't pay it, go to 55, right? right. The bottom line, the bottom line is, or, or you go to 55 and if they're not paying at 55, you call the, call the rep and you say, take it back, right? Right. I okay. tried. I tried to do it. Your map pricing. You guys are. You guys are pricing it at this number because they can be flexible to price a little bit lower. A grand example of this, Nike, right? One of the iconic American brands, and and we're running out of time here. The iconic American brands about two years ago, coming out of COVID, said, "Hey, we don't need to sell Belk anymore. We don't need to sell, you know, any of these department stores." or any of these Foot Lock or anything, everybody's either gonna to come to a Nike store or gonna to go to nike.com. We'll right. allow a little bit of the stuff to go to Dick's Sporting Goods. We're very curated, right? Because we're Nike, people love us. And what they found is their sales plummeted, right? Because they didn't sell the heart sogs. In their, in their level, the heart sogs is Macy's, right? Like, right. They didn't sell those guys. And no matter what those guys price it, that's sales that, didn't happen. So I was in the main, I was on the main floor of Macy's Herald Square in New York City last week. And now it's all Nike again, right? Because Nike realized they made a mistake. So, okay. so you remember, the, I go back to the, and again, I'm becoming for full transparency uh, on the, on the project as a part of, um, as a part of the ARC, uh, I think it's a part of the ARC uh, grant program. I'm, I get to work with Glenda uh, on a weekly basis uh, on her business. And so I know that you have an incredibly loyal customer. And so, yeah, they might find it for $4 cheaper, but they're already in your store. They come to your store all the time. Right. right? And as they find you and as they find you on Shopify and more so they find you on Kate. We, we shop. shop. We shop SC, see how I threw that in. Beyond Main and we shop. <laughs> right. And the national Beyond Main site, right? Well, as they find it, they'll make those decisions. And you'll okay. see, hey, I didn't do any online sales, but I sold a bunch of them in store at the 59. Right. It's a win. Okay. Yeah. Kate, final thoughts? I, what I typically see is that a five. Yeah, I was just going to add on that. Oh, my internet is unstable. Hang on. You're good. I'll stop my video. Maybe that'll help. No, you're fine. Um, what I was just going to add on, what I was just going to add on to that is that usually a five to 10% pricing difference um, doesn't make, if it's, you know, more than that pricing doesn't typically factor into the consumer's decision making process it's when you start to kind of tip over into the 15 the 20 or more then they really start to price evaluate but um in the small business landscape you can typically be a few dollars more which is great um and i think what kind of edges it out is that loyalty factor and that instant gratification factor they need it now they're typically down to the wire that's where we're seeing you know the, the customizable aspects of like the gift wrapping that you do the personalized shopping additional things they can pick up so i think you when you start to play in the five to ten percent space you're fine when you get over that is when i start to see more of the pricing competitiveness um at play for consumers decision making process mm -hmm. that's just my my Post observations in the field. <laughs> <laughs> okay, science, but my observations. Exactly, but Kate, Kate, it's 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 probably, and now I'm going to put my my Beyond Main hat on. It's probably worthwhile for mm -hmm. us as Beyond Main, as we shop, to publish some rules of the road that we believe. Again, we're <laughs> going to be wrong too. I want to say it. Thirteen weeks 
five to 10%, all these things is kind of like pricing rules, you know, pricing suggestions. I think we can, we can actually give an enormous value to small business just by giving those, those guard, a few of those guardrails. Yeah, that's a great point. Do not shy away from talking, having frank product-based conversations with your vendor reps. They are wrong too sometimes. They are. And it's actually very helpful for them to influence change or new programs, new pricing programs. It is, I I echo that, even of sitting on the other side of the table. I always loved when my partner, retail partners came to me with very clear numbers and um, data for helping us improve processes, efficiencies, assortments, all of it. All right. Well, thanks for hanging on a few minutes late. This was wonderful. I think really great like reminders and and tips for how to think about pricing, how to position your business for competitive advantage, how to, you know, do some research on your competitive landscape and understand where you fit in your market um, and within the industry. So thank you, Jeremy. Really loved it. And I hope you all enjoyed um, the time today and we'll see you next month. So go, go out. Price with purpose. <laughs> yes. Thank you guys. Bye, everyone. It's an honor. Appreciate it.